Yeah, trust no very trust no time on it. Let me trust no let me trust no for a I 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
He was very much impressed by your lecture. He was very much impressed by your lecture. Every one of you have come to your valuable time. Uh, before we get started, uh, we have our honorable uh, people around here. The uh, Buddhist Art Gallery is honored. Mr. Rajendra Rajvajacharya and Mr. We are all welcome to my gallery. We will do a talk program. After this talk program, we go to the gallery. My gallery is just five minutes back from here. Okay? Okay, thanks for that. Also, we have Mr. Prakash Kalader. Is that there? How many of you are here? And we have our world famous. Artist Mr. Robert Baer, thank you so much for to stay here. Before we get started with the program, firstly, I would like to give you a few information about Buddhist Art Gallery. Buddhist Art Gallery has been founded in 2062, and the, and it has been encouraging the artists to shape their knowledge about the culture and religions, about Buddhist art and tankas. Also, interestingly, Buddhist Art Gallery has been opening the Buddhist Library so that every one of you can visit the library. Now, moving on with the program, as we all know, our guest of honor, the world's famous artist, Mr. Robert Baer, is in front of us. I would like to give you a few information about Robert Baer. Robert Baer, who is an artist, an author, an illustrator, a collector, oh my goodness, so much of new facts in front of him that would get him to the level of the legend. We would say he is the legend of the history of art, of Buddhist and Tanka arts. So 40 years and over 15 years he has been working with the talented artists of Kathmandu Valley uh, nourishing their nourishing their skills, supporting them to enhance their knowledge and taking the, the finest art. There he had exhibited our art from Buddhist. So it's more than honored to have been contributed our arts there to him. So we thank you very much. Thank you. Our participants to uh, participate and questionnaires question with our uh, world famous artist Robert Baer. You can question Annie about the new art and Tibetan arts uh, and its development, which we could do it for our future dates. So I would like to hand over the mic to Robert there. You see, there's a lot of people sitting at the back. And uh, where is the beta? The beta is somewhere. Uh, uh, um, I would first of all ask how many people here are uh, popa painters or tonka painters or artists? Obviously. Um, anyway, a, a thousand of galleries, whatever, would say. I haven't. I did various exhibitions of Newar art, uh, three or four, four or five in America, and an exhibition comes and goes. It takes weeks and weeks to prepare an exhibition, months often before. Uh, Samundra is having an exhibition which is opening on the 29th this month in May and it's only running for 12 days and Samundra is um, one of the finest artists in, in the world as far as I'm concerned as, as is Deepak over here. Deepak is a very uh, skilled and knowledgeable Buddhist artist and Udai Charan Shrestha who was hopefully he was going to come today who is also one of the great greatest Newar artists and these three uh, are amongst the, the people that I respect most in, uh, in Kathmandu Valley. They're, they're really, really wonderful people. Um, this is a bit tricky. This is a microphone and I can sit straight. Um, basically, when did I start interest in painting? It was in, in school. I started when I was very young. Um, I had a very profound experience when my younger sister died at 14, where 
it was a very strong spiritual experience where she came back and, and showed me who she was. She wasn't a three-year-old mentally handicapped child, interested, seriously deformed, but a, an eternal spirit. So I would say from the age of 14 I was initiated into the world of spirit, or spiritualism, um, which has always been my underlying reason for everything I study. In, in my younger years, in the, eight, in the 1960s, I, was, I took a lot of psychedelic drugs, LSD, um, was very involved in Eastern art, in Gnostic Christianity, in mysticism, Sufism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Tantra, all of these things. And then I had a very profound experience where I literally blew out my whole psychic nervous system and I was, yes, that's when I came to India, Maja mainly because my girlfriend was studying Chari, Chari and Nietzsche dance and they know well about Bajacharya dance and uh, Ratna Kaji Bajacharya was coming to my house three times a week and his son Gautam was a painter and I just became very fascinated by Newa culture. The first time I came to Kathmandu was 1970 so I was already uh, painting deities at that time so 1970 till now is 36 years. Um, maybe I could be called an expert sometimes. An expert is somebody who started before somebody else. That's all it is really. If you if you really start early and and, and devote a lot of time, then you become somebody who recognizes an expert. But you have to really do the work. You really have to do the research. You have to understand what you're doing. It has to make sense has to make sense to you completely. It doesn't have to be a mystery that you're doing some strange practice and it's going to bring a result. You really, really need to make sense of everything in life. Painting a tonker, painting a polka, a new polka. It's, you know, hours and hours every day, sometimes working for three months on a painting, sometimes for two weeks, sometimes for two years. I've worked on painting for um, one year once and and that series of paintings that I made in India. I was working every day, painting. And a lot of the painting is involved with breath control. It's holding the breath while you make a very, very, very long, precise line. And after, every artist would, would, would know these things. And you, so you develop a certain kind of uh, sensibility, which is quite unique. And it's to do with patience, it's to do with breath control. Because I spent I would say I spent 30 years at the drawing board, working 360 days a year, maybe take five days off every year to go see family, something like that. Working sometimes 12, 15 hours a day. And because of that, I appreciate the work of all of the artists who are doing the work in Kathmandu Valley. So when I came back here in 1986 for the first time, I saw how much influence my art that had been published in posters and books book cover illustrations and influence of Tibetan art world. Yeah. There was very little newer art around in 1986, personal relationships. Previous to that time they were kept and none of the dealers in Tamil would tell you who I had in contact with them, not just myself, but a, a few other friends. One particular friend who was a Sikhanese artist called uh, my friend Anto. Over the years, I had no money until I sold my own collection of paintings in 2001 in America. And then I began collecting the more art and selling some smaller pieces so that I could keep particular pieces. So I have a very um, nice collection. And also, Regenda has a very beautiful collection in the, the gallery that he's established here. So in brief, that's me. So essentially, this is a question and answer session. Um, so, if anybody has questions related to art, I will answer those, but I will just add one caveat, one little bit at the end. Um, my daughter was drowned ten years ago in an accident, my elder daughter, and since that time, I've always studied spiritual uh, reality. Since that time, I, I gave up everything to do with any kind of dogma any religious tradition and decided that I really needed to find out for myself what happens when you die. And so I would say now I have a, a deep knowledge of afterlife experience. 
I have spent uh, my whole life studying this, but for the last 10 years I've been doing research into what is called near-death experience, the accounts of hospice workers, intensive care, nurse workers, deathbed visions, people who die and what they see, past life regression, regression into the space between lives, um, spiritual mediumship, all of these things, and coupled with modern science and what has been discovered about the uh, nature of the universe and the nature of the inner cosmos. And I feel like I'm in a place now where all I, I'm doing is research. I'm researching the nature of the universe and how the universe works. So that's where I am now. So in a sense, I'm not, for the past 10 years, I haven't been really involved in studying art as such or Buddhism or the deities. I've written extensively on various pantheons of deities, both in the Newa tradition and the Tibetan tradition, most of which is still unpublished. I've had very bad luck with um, many things in my life. I've had lots of disappointments. And a lot of the artists have had similar experiences, so that's why I feel a very close connection with them. And I spend on, you know, just working with the sick God. So, that is me, and I will ask any question to anybody else, and I'll try and answer it. But I do not trust my memory anymore, so I may forget them. As we know, you have also uh, some uh, masterpieces in your collection, yeah? Yes. So, uh, uh, what did you find, uh, especially, uh, I mean, um, difference uh, uh, in Sibimuni's artwork? So, can you explain us? <laughs> he was born in 1944. He died in 2001. And his father was a famous artist called Ananda Muni, who basically was um, at the age of, of about 16, went to Tibet, was recognized in Tibet as a divine artist. He, he painted portraits of Newa, um, the Newa merchants around the Bapo in Lhasa and uh, came to the attention of the region of the 13th, the previous Dalai Lama, who rewarded him, the previous Dalai Lama rewarded him with um, a chest containing mineral pigments. You see? Um, Siddhi Muni was a, a genius. He, he was very, very ambitious. He wanted to be better than his father. And he developed, he took his father's work and in a sense developed a whole new a way of combining elements of Buddhist and Newer art, Tibetan Buddhist and Newer art, and to make these very, very unique and almost like um, legendary compositions because there was so much in them. The bracelets would have dragons in them, there would be necklaces with, with, angel, with peacocks and all kinds of garudas and makaras appearing in the, in the crown, in the jewels. Uh, so his work fascinated me. In 1973, he was making much simpler work. That looks like a piece of uh, City Mooney's up there. I'm not sure. Is that a copy of the City Mooney? Yeah. I don't know what yes. that is. I can't see it very yeah. well. Is that right? Yeah, City Mooney's copy. Yeah, so he was very, very impressive. Um, Did he have a bit of Crosby Stills in that? Yeah. Yeah. So he bought these paintings and he made prints of them. And then Graham Nash went on to develop duplex painting techniques. Yeah. Tilly Mooney in 1973, and I went to his house many times. And then one day I took one of my own paintings, which is a very small painting of a forum. It was a photograph. <laughs> and then uh, he realized that I, when he was told that I painted, he, he was almost like he closed the door. He had three great masterpieces that he made over a period of 10 years. And I ended up buying two of them myself because I sold all my own art to buy Sydney Witness to this of Sydney Um And they hang above my desk where I sit in my room and, and um, they just stay there with the collection, part of the collection I have. So Sydney Mooney was a, a great inspiration to me. Really, a truly great, and truly great inspiration to, I think, the whole generation of newer artists. An opportunity to have one of your books called Symbolism of. Buddhism? Um, I don't have a book called Symbolism of Buddhism. I have a book called Symbolism of Tibetan Encyclopedia of 
Tibetan symbols in my well, I forgot the title, but and, there is a book by you. There's a handbook, a handbook of Tibetan symbols. Oh, right, exactly. Yeah, yes. there, yeah. I had that book. Then, after getting that book, you know, I recommended a couple of my friends in the same professions like freelance tour guide, you know, working for different languages. Yes. But when they went to a different bookstore, they could not find the book, you know, it was so difficult. They said they are running out of stock. Mm -hmm. May I know what is the reason actually? I found this book to be so useful, you know, especially for guides. But, you know, we could not find <laughs> more than few pieces. Okay. Um, bookshop. If you go see Peter. Exactly. Uh, bookshop? Yeah. Peter, what's his name? Peter Dunbar. Yeah. Peter Dunbar. Yeah. Virtual bookshop, virtual books, and it's in Tamil, opposite the UT Hotel. Okay. Um, he will get on the case. He's probably got copies there. Yeah. Decide how to title the book in terms of saying Tonka or Pova. Why did you not include Pova in your encyclopedia and the terminology? Is it because Tibetan Buddhism is more worldly known, or was that on purpose? I don't know. I can talk you about everything. But essentially, in my encyclopedia, I thought when I wrote that book, um, I, I'd spent years making the drawings for the book. And I don't have a teacher. I, so most of the information that came from me was from oral tradition that I picked up from various from the painters, masters, when I studied in India. But mainly it rose from study and intuition, from understanding the symbolism. In the, in the early 70s, 1970, no, sorry, in 1980, 1979, 80, I set out to produce a book called The Deities of the Karmakagya Tradition, one of the main protected deities. It was just about 90 deities. A friend of mine had all the, uh, translated all of that, named Edward Henning. He's a great master of the Kalashakra system now, and, uh, and especially of Tibetan astrology. He knows more about Tibetan astrology than any Tibetan. Ed Edward Henning, H E W N I N G. Um, so Edward did all of these translations from rare texts of the belonging to the Kamakagi tradition. Of, of, and it, it had the symbolism, a lot on the symbolism in there. And this is kind of was a key to me. It came from intuitive understanding, like an intuitive knowledge. It came from intuition. I think the more you, when you work with a visual image, it kind of, it's it's speaking to you. It's part of you. It's, it's your creation, and it's it's also creating you at the same time. The process of, of artist and creation are, are linked in, during that period. And you question why. You know why is Shakyamuni standing on Shiva, like Bhairava, and why is his head bent back like that, and why is his foot pressing on his head? Very strange posture. But he's pressing on the head and the heart, so that's why the head is bent back. And why is his, his other foot pressing on the breast of Kalaratri, who's the female figure on the opposite side? The breast is the place of desire, the, the brain is the place of jealousy, and the heart is the place of aggression. So he's triumphing over these three poisons that he pulls from his peacock throne. And just out of my, it was like, I understand now how the five Buddha families originated, because the West is the peacock throne, the throne of Amitabha the head in the West. And then when you look at the other one, the lion throne of uh, Ratnasambhava in, uh, in Sri Lanka, and. It just made sense, the, the directions from India. So essentially, when I wrote the encyclopedia, I thought I would get a lot of flack because I was looking at Indian, so early Indian sources for the symbols, what they were at that time. So I would have liked to have entitled it indo Tibetan Buddhism. And it basically, as the Dalai Lama says, I, my, I'm not a Tibetan Buddhist, my tradition is in the Landa tradition. So it, it comes from India, yeah. It comes from India and in various islands from Central Asia and China and of course Tibet itself. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, but the roots of all of these things come from India. So it's in Indian culture that, we, that I find the most meaning of the century. Mm -hmm. Very unknown. It's completely and, unknown. Yeah. And uh, even though it's the origin of the art form of Tonka, it's like all people only discuss Tonka, Tonka, Tonka. 
and so I, I wondered what you think about that, or, or do you try to endorse the word Pova? It wasn't really the origin of the Tonka. The Tonka came from Pata. Pata was in, in Indian, the, the, the Palasena dynasty of, of essentially Western India. Mm -hmm. It wiped out everything in, in northern India, essentially, and um, so that tradition was maintained in the Kathmandu Valley. And previous to that, a lot of Newar artists had been employed in, in Tibet, essentially using models that were based on the early Pata style of the Buddhist art from the Palasana dynasty. Mm -hmm. None of this art survives because of the atmospheric conditions in India. Only the sculpture survives in some early painting from Ajanta in the Laura caves like this. <clears throat> but in terms of Vajrayana art, it's essentially mainly statues that survive that you see in museums, from Indian statues from the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century like this. And by a sense of these various uh, dynasties that came along, which also followed the names of earlier Indian dynasties. So this is history. <laughs> if a person dies at a, at a young age, then is it because of its karma or it's because of uh, how should I say that? A sign. Yeah, a sign. Yeah. 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 This the head was bigger than the body. The head was like this, and there was a face underneath and a tiny little body. She could all he could do was turn her over, and she would respond to music. She would never develop any ability to speak or to cognition in, in the sense. It, it, but at the same time, she was co a completely, a, her emotional content was completely there. Her, her spirit was there, her spirit. She, the spirit was embodied, but it would never have the mental faculties of the sense of operational. Because everything that we see is received through our senses. You know, the, what they say in birth, actually, when you look at it, it's sound waves that cause it little vibrations on, on years pass into bones and we're processing all this with electrical signals in the brain so there's this whole process taking place <clears throat> who took me up into a heavenly realm a celestial realm which, which was quite amazingly beautiful and spacious and it was a place of absolute divine love of unconditional love and it was a very, very short experience and it kind of I didn't tell anybody about it for maybe 20 years because it was, it was so odd. Yeah. And then, you know, when I was uh, less intent than 20 years, but then maybe in my, when I became interested in Buddhism about 18 years old or so, um, you know, then I got interested in the whole ideas of religious traditions. But now I would say that uh, it wasn't, what did you come here to suffer? What did you come here to learn? It wasn't that. It was, but what did you come here to teach? She came here to teach me to go into these dimensions that I've gone. And if it wasn't there, I wouldn't be the person that I am now. So I see her as my first real teacher and probably my last real teacher because I, I, I feel like I have access to her uh, in the spirit world now. Um, and all I can say about is that life after death, I would say, the evidence is overwhelming. If anybody chooses to study like I have, it's absolutely overwhelming, and you can't help but be uh, changed, transformed by the experience. And personally, I find the experience of doing this research over the last 10 years, nothing but that research, has had the most transformative effect on my me far more profound than if I've been doing 10 years meditation practice on retreat. I feel that uh, it's given me a certainty, a, a level of humility as well. As, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of, that the universe is full of intelligence. And people who have near-death experiences, it's a very small percentage, maybe 15% who are brought back to life afterwards. The first one is that it's ineffable. Ineffable means it's in, you cannot describe what happened. It, it does not belong in this world. It's, it cannot tell people you can just try and 
uh, used symbols or images to, as, as a great lama, and somebody asked him what was, he disappeared, he was a sadhu for three years, and somebody said what was the most profound experience he had, and he had a near-death experience. And he said after that his practice became crystal clear. <coughs> he, um, um, it deepened far more than he could possibly understand, he couldn't relate the experience. Don't need to have these experiences, you can, I found through doing the research, I learned so much about unconditional love, about pure honesty, about uh, being naked, a humble human being. But it's, it radically causes a change because you cannot be false in the face of what you're witnessing. It's so, so pure and so profound. My mother passed away and I have, I have continuously been seeing her in my dreams. I see her going through the light. Uh, I do not know that if that's my vision that I'm seeing or it's her, sim it's her symptom or how could I say that? Um, is she trying to see me something? I mean, I get confused. So I want to know from you that. I'll be more detail after today. Okay, sure. I'm here for some days if, if I'm with you again. And she will be coming to see you in, in like a deathbed vision. When people are dying in hospice in, in the West, if, if, if people who work in hospice, it's very well known that there are three things they see. They call them visions, trips, and crowded rooms. Visions are the visions of the other world. The trips are people say, I'm, I'm going on a journey, I need to pack my bags. And the crowded rooms are the number of dead relatives or dead friends who come in just before that person is dying. And it's very, very common that, that even the hospice workers sometimes are aware of all of these spiritual beings who come from, that come to help somebody in the next life. Um, the most meaningful thing in my life. And when people say that, you know, that all of this is nonsense, I no longer feel upset or angry because I just think they have no idea. It's just, uh, that, uh, if, you have to, uh, if you have to have an opinion, you need knowledge. You really need knowledge. No need. No need. <laughs> You are known for a big collector also. Uh, you have lots of collection of newer arts and Tibetan arts. So my question is, in future, what is your plans uh, for that paintings? What you are going to do that painting? Is it stored in your own collection or it is exhibited somewhere? Yes. <laughs> your work is on the walls in my room. <laughs> what is your, in future, what you are going to do that painting? Well, well I realize that I'm, I'm, I'm no longer as fit as I'm 68 years old. I have a, a very bad lung problem, a disease called emphysema. It's very hard for me to walk up the steps with my kin here. Um, so I, I get breathless. So I, I realize that, you know, I'm transitory. So. I've, I've written lists uh, on the back of each painting. I've put a number of the artist and the date, and then the size of the painting, and then there's lists on my computer. I don't actually, my partner Jill doesn't actually have all of that knowledge, but um, I'm trying to kind of prepare for it now, prepare for it now, because the work, it doesn't really belong to me, it belongs to the artists who created it, and it belongs to the world at large. Ideally, I would like to have the images published in books and to have a collection, uh, a permanent collection somewhere. My idea, essentially, was to have a traveling exhibition that would go from America, England, Japan, Germany, and to produce very beautiful color book, coloring books. But throughout my life, everybody I've worked with who's come into my life and said they were going to help me do something has ended up usually just taking what they can from me and leaving me be. And so all of the writing that I did for these books is still on my computer. Um, I'm trying the best I can where I am in the West to, um, um, you know, try and set things in motion that the, the collection is it's been photographed. Everything's been professionally photographed. So in a sense, all of that exists. It's, it's already safe, not only in my house, but in my houses on, on external hard drives, the information. Um, so, in future, I, I really don't know. It depends what happens here in Kathmandu. It depends what happens in Kathmandu.
to what happens in the will. The will situation is, is very precarious. Uh, I don't think, looking into the future, I don't think the world is going to be such a safe place anyway. If, if this opera was in Turkey and Islamic State came in, it would be gone immediately, you know. Rubin Museum in America. Uh, Dean of Bang, though I did say I would lend a large part of my collection for an exhibition that was going to take place in the Music Ebay, supposedly this year, but I haven't given anything about it. Um, which took place around Boston after the American Civil War, um, where, where writers like Nathaniel Hawthorne, Edgar Allan Poe, Preston um, wrote Walden, uh, Kevin wrote, uh, yeah, Henry Thoreau. All of these people were kind of active, and it was to do with the slave trade industry. Um, what was happening in the South, the Civil War, was basically over slavery. It is or not, but uh, during any sort of you know like uh, spiritual practice, um, especially in Vajrayana, uh, we have to receive some sort of empowerment yes. in order to begin that spiritual practice. Yes. So I'm not quite sure whether this applies to the uh, Buddhist painting of deities or not, whether you need to receive certain empowerment, some sort of permission to paint, you know, these deities. So, uh, if it is necessary, then have you, you know, received? E yes, uh, I mean, the tradition, but the tradition has to change also in modern times. Yeah, so, so you, t you think that um, uh, people don't need to receive empowerment in order to do some sort of, you know, TV painting? It depends what you, which deity you're painting. You know, certain high yoga tantra, unitary yoga tantra deities. Um, one needs a, an empowerment of at least one of those deities, essentially. And I've received such an empowerment as Deepak and probably other people received similar empowerments. Oh, I see. I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, but it, it, in terms of a tonka, a tonka painters, um, it's about the incredible, incredible knowledge they carry. You know, they would receive. One of my own teachers, although I, I wouldn't, you know, it wasn't somebody I was going to study with every day, I just happened to live in the next room. He was the, the, the state artist of Tibet. He was Jumper, Jumper La from Jumper Tetan from Laza. And, you know, I, I, I was learning Tonka painting, this is like 1971-1972 in Dharamsala and I'd go out in the night and uh, to pee, you know, and I'd see his light was on and my light was on and no other light was on, it was one o'clock in the morning in the Kathmandu Valley, he was working, I was working. He, he, you know, he worked to death basically, he died of death cancer, you know, in, back in 1984. Uh, knowledge, the works you have, uh, you have done. Uh, you know, I would like you to highlight which tradition is older. And, and, uh, I mean, I will name the two. One is uh, Tibetan Tanka tradition, and the other is uh, Newari painting tradition. So, just you know, based on your experience, yeah. which tradition do you think is older? I, I covered that earlier because I talked about the palace and the dynasty, at least in India. Which was, which, which was patronized by the Pala, mainly by the Pala. They were Buddhist kings, so they patronized a lot of the art in India. So really, the, the blossoming, the final blossoming in Indian Buddhist culture happened between the 8th and 12th centuries in India. 8th and 12th centuries, this is the time that Padmasambhava went into Tibet. This is the time when the 84 Mahasiddhas lived, and the 84 Mahasiddhas were responsible for transmitting all of the uh, lineages, practices of these country traditions into Tibet. The Tibetans would come to India to study with people like Naropa or Kuguripa or, or you know, Gantepa or somebody like this. Um, so that there was a big interchange between India and Tibet. But really, the central house of the creation of the art and the imagery was India itself. And it also goes back to Kashmir, to, to the uh, Gandhara art and the area of Udhyana and all the rest things. So, you know, the, the evolution of the Buddha images took place in India from the time around the Gupta period and the 
Gandhara period, second, third, fourth centuries onwards, influenced highly by the Greeks. The Greeks came across with Alexander. And then, of course, there was Ashoka, who previously um, in India did a lot, and also in, in Nepal. So Buddhism in Nepal was the pathway between India and Tibet, between Eastern India and Tibet. A lot of the Buddhist traditions passed through the Kathmandu Valley, which was then known as the Kingdom of Nepal. And the pole was then became well known for its three cities, Babylon, which the statue made in Kathmandu, which is a painting, and Bhaktapur, which is wood carving. And so those artists, artists were taken from the pole into Tibet to produce a lot of what we call early Tibetan art. But originally it came from India, and then it was preserved in the pole. And then when all of these mandalas were painted in Buddhist monasteries, mainly the Saki monasteries in southern Tibet, they were done by newer artists. So the newer artists actually brought these images into new images into creation. It is very strictly based on the lineages that come from. Yes. But today like it is the house like because of the painters they modified and they've been painting on their own. Uh, they, they say it's a creative house, but then, but then they modified the traditional lineage things they have. And uh, most of the people, they don't consider it to be like good or it's a deterioration of the lineage they have. Uh, I just want to know like, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I think about it. It's a um, map, map of the deity. It's a, it's a, everything is sim symbolic. Everything in there has got a map of it in and a secret meaning. And do you want to come inside? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're okay. Okay, I can see you through that. <clears throat> e everything has a specific meanings and levels of meaning. But at the same time, there can be innovation. In the history of Tibetan art, what I was really fascinated with was some particular artists would assemble a group of offerings in a way that was so unique and so precise, accurate. It wasn't a copy from somebody, they, it, it was an original mental creation. A great artist was able to do that. And, and of course now people copy a lot. So what has been lost is, is the whole understanding of the art. And I agree, Setchin Gomper is here, there are many Tonka painters around Broda. Some of whom will have Tibetan tongue painters will have great knowledge and a true knowledge of the art. And I would recommend that if you're going to paint Buddhist deities as opposed to Newa Paupas, that you really study Buddhist art. You really, really study. You really understand. It has to make sense. Everything in life has to make sense. Otherwise, it's a symbol. It's an empty thing. Somebody else has a question? Or are you all getting fed up? know a little bit more how do you at what point do you make that distinction because I know like meditation is something it's sort of like it, it's become like this thing you say like music is meditation and art is meditation and everything is meditation and walking is meditation it was really interesting that you would draw the distinction between medica meditation and devotion and I just you know is it the artist is it the art itself um, is it the process that's about devotion is it just a byproduct that you finish a painting and it just develops that devotion or just a little more on that. Do you the attributes, everything connected with the composition? Because you're in, in the actual meditation practice, you're visualizing those, the, the realms of those deities. And of course, each deity has its own mandala, especially the higher yoga tantra deity mandalas. Um, Deepak is giving a talk in two weeks. Week. We're not sure on, on the Shakasambara 62 day to Shakasambara Mandala, and he will explain there a little bit about the retinue of deities, the body, speech, mind deities that encircle it. So, in the actual, very, very complicated, if somebody's doing a long three year retreat, a, a Yidam deity practice, like a higher tantra yoga deity practice, would usually take anything from 10 or 15 months to 18 months to do, and then there are after practices afterwards. And you do it in retreat situations, so you, every day you do in sessions of practice and with lots and lots of prayers. So it, it is very, very specific. So the meditation practice 
is identification with the deity. Yoga postures and breathing and exercises to, to actually bring the fruition of the deity, to bring the taste of the deity into your consciousness so that your, the deity is, is there. Yes. I guess there is no question. There, thank you so much, Joe, for sharing your experiences. I hope we got to your answers. And uh, now? For you for being so attentive and the questions were great, thank you. I, I would uh, honestly happily stay here all day and answer questions, but you know, time is short, I think we need to do things. Uh, we will be moving to the art gallery. Uh, is this some undress again? This is City Mooney or City Mooney or of the sun. This is uh, <coughs> this is um, super odd. Draw the pair, please. Yes, uh, so that we can give you a token of love. This is the video. This is our life. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and all the respectful guests who have arrived today for this program, I am Arendra Raj Badusai. I'm very glad today to see your participation. You all have given your valuable time and also very good questions. I hope you have already gained many knowledge about the Buddhism and New Tantra. And Robert Beer and I were working together since uh, 30, 40 years. So we have a very good relationship. And our motive was always to work together and to dedicate our time for developing art and artists. So I used to go to artists and teach them techniques and I buy art and that art I used to give to Robert Bear. The Robert Bear, sometimes they give to some museums. That's how we together are able to promote art and artists of the time. And today I am extremely very happy because Robert Muir already of very old, but still he came. Before just one month, we were not sure. Because Robert Muir's beloved friend, Jim, was worried about his health. So, see, see us. we want to send Robert Muir to Nepal, but we are worried about this with Ponson. <laughs> so I sent three four letters to get her truth. Trustworthy. After that, Robert is happy to come here. But the first invitation for Robert was from Samudra Man. I think this already has been some for my Robert. And second was my invitation. And I only take opportunity about the invitation which is done by Samudra Man. That's how we are together. Very nicely, we are now. Would be very nice. So this is one of my collection, and I give this to Robert Munger for his contribution for preserving the very arts and artists of Nepal. So where shall I put it? In my heart. It's already in my heart. It's resting in my heart right now. Um, different locations where he set up a little gallery center. And this new one is just here. He has a wonderful collection. And the library looks great. It's got a, a collection of books. And he's very uh, enthusiastic. He's, he's the most enthusiastic person I know in the world about trying to 
preserve the culture of Nepal. He's, he's, his whole life is fascinated by this, and he has archives, he has photocopies of all the important documents, things that one can trace back, and he has his centre here. And yeah, he's, he's great. I bow down to people like him. And, and Samundra and his wife, lovely wife Davita, who's somewhere in the background there, <laughs> who's a great inspiration to Samundra and a great inspiration to me. And and then Deepak and his brother is here, and Puna, the artist, is here, and I don't know who else is here, but um, really, it's, uh, it's an honour to, to be with you all today. Thank you very much, really, and I'm, I'm deeply touched. Uh, thanks a lot, Robert. For Talking something about me? Uh, one last thing. I would also mention some of his exhibition, which you can tell him where it's happening. So, uh, I want to many things about the Buddhist art and culture with our, you know, world renowned Robert Bear. I hope uh, everybody is very happy, and I thank you a lot for this. I hope you will participate even another programs. We have four programs. For example, on Wednesday we have a program about Deepak Joshi. Deepak Joshi is another very famous artist of Nepal. He is Deepak Joshi. Uh, he has taken one masterpiece after a mandala. It is called Chakra Sambara, which he took more than two years to finish. That is an amazing work. So this tanka is in display. So after this program, we go to my gallery and we can see his mandala. Today we see his mandala and if somebody would like to know what is the meaning of the mandala, what is the use of the mandala, then he will explain about this on Wednesday. Then slowly we go to the gallery. Okay, thank you. There are lots of things, but this is not my model language, so I shortly I, I would like to invite you all that uh, my exhibition is going to held on this May 29 uh, at uh, Nepal Art Council. All, all the public. I would like to invite you all for uh, my coming exhibition. Thank you. Without music, I make my class negative.